Good day and welcome to another Anti-Money Laundering Outreach Session, presented by the Anti-Money Laundering, AML, slash Anti-Terrorist Financing, ATF, Department of the Bermuda Monetary Authority, Authority or BMA. This session is a continuation of the outreach seminars that the Authority is conducting with regulated financial institutions as part of our updated engagement strategy. This seminar aims to ensure that industry sectors are kept up to date on changes to AML and prudential legislation, areas of Financial Action Task Force, FATF, focus, and highlight areas where industry sectors are performing well or need to make improvements. We hope this engagement will increase the dialogue on critical issues, assist the financial services sector in strengthening prudential and AML-ATF systems and controls and enhance overall compliance with the legislation. Today's presentation is broken down into six parts. Following the introduction, we will hear from our colleagues in the Banking Trust Corporate Services and Investment Team who will discuss prudential issues and expectations relating to the CSP sector. Next, the AML team will discuss money laundering, ML, and terrorist financing, TF, risks, AML obligations, supervisory trends and the authority's expectations. Next, the Financial Intelligence Agency will provide information on ML-TF trends, typologies, and SAR reporting. Finally, the Authority's Enforcement Team will provide an overview of the Authority's enforcement powers and our processes. The first section of this presentation will focus on supervisory issues raised by the Banking, Trust, Corporate Service Providers and Investment Business Department. We will first provide a short introduction of the Regulatory Framework for Corporate Service Providers CSPs. We will then provide an overview of the findings from the sectoral thematic review completed in 2021, as well as themes from the results of on-site examinations for the years 2019 to 2023. Next, we will focus on the main weaknesses that the authority's on-site team has continued to identify. From there, we will re-emphasize key regulatory principles related to these common areas of deficiency and provide examples of best practices. The areas we will focus on are split into two sections, which are 1. Corporate Governance, Management and Administration and 2. Risk and Compliance. At the end, we will highlight the key takeaways on the topics discussed. The objective of the outreach is to provide further clarity on the authority's expectations regarding ongoing compliance with the minimum criteria for licensing. This next topic provides an introduction and background information of the Corporate Service Providers Regulatory Framework. This section is divided into three parts. Starting with the regulatory framework, followed by the findings from the 2021 thematic review. To finish this section, we will discuss themes from issues identified during on site inspections over the last five years. Firstly, it is important to highlight that the authority applies the proportionality principle in its supervisory approach. We assess compliance with the CSP regulatory regime based on the nature, size, and complexity of each licensee. The authority does not apply a one-size-fits-all approach in its supervisory activities. The CSP regime is primarily governed by the following regulatory documents. The Corporate Service Provider Act 2012, the CSP Code of Practice, the CSP Corporate Governance Policy, the CSP Statement of Principles, the Operational Cyber Risk Management Code of Conduct and the Outsourcing Guidance Notes. The CSP Act is the primary statutory instrument, which is supplemented by other regulatory documents. Overall, these documents encompass the minimum licensing criteria and the ongoing requirements that CSPs must adhere to while conducting business. It is important that licensees have a strong understanding of the CSP regulatory framework to facilitate satisfactory compliance with the regime. Please note the Act provides a licensing regime for any person or entity, unless otherwise exempted, that carries out corporate service provider, CSP, business as defined by the Act, in or from within Bermuda. CSPs with related or affiliated entities in their group structure who may be engaging in CSP activities without being licensed should review their activities to ensure compliance with licensing obligations. If in doubt, it is best to be proactive and communicate directly with the authority. Now, we will move to the 2021 thematic review. In 2021 the authority performed a thematic review of the CSP sector to assess adherence to certain key principles detailed in the CSP Code of Practice. This initiative included the circulation of questionnaires covering the areas of client due diligence, client monies, internal management controls, conflict of interest, advertising and communications, terms of business and complaints handling. 
The conclusions drawn were primarily based on the quality and details included in the respective questionnaires, in addition to assessing the adequacy of policies, procedures, and other relevant supporting documentation included with the submissions. Overall, the review's results were generally positive. Most respondents demonstrated a satisfactory level of compliance across the various sections covered in the thematic review. 80% of respondents demonstrated a satisfactory level of compliance across the various sections covered in the thematic review, while 20% of respondents were partially or non-compliant. However, the results also illustrated that improvements are required in specific areas. These include, among others, the enhancement of operational policies, formalization of service standards, improved training programs and disclosure practices related to conflicts of interests and the complaints process. You can see the results presented on the table shown. The authority regularly conducts prudential on-site reviews of licensed CSPs consistent with its risk-based approach to supervision. The purpose of on-site supervision is to enable the authority to review compliance with policies and procedures, as well as the processes that management have put in place to monitor and control key risks in the business. On-site supervision involves structured visits to a CSP's offices where, typically, the authority interviews a range of management and staff policies and other relevant information as well as in evaluating a sample of client files. The findings from on-site examinations for the last five years illustrate that further action and efforts are required in the areas of corporate governance and internal controls. Regarding governance, the authority consistently observed deficiencies in the adequacy and scope of oversight practices performed by board of directors. There were numerous occasions when the authority identified that licensees failed to satisfy various principles articulated in the CSP corporate governance policy. The area of internal controls primarily relates to deficiencies identified within the compliance and risk management programs of the respective licensees. In these instances, licensees generally did not adequately implement appropriate compliance and risk management frameworks to effectively manage risks and to ensure business is conducted in a prudent manner. The deficiencies in these areas were generally the root cause of other issues identified during on-site examinations. Given the above, the authority will reinforce some key regulatory standards and provide examples of best practices that will hopefully assist CSPs in enhancing their compliance with regulatory requirements. The next slide details corporate governance, management, and administration. The board remains responsible for the approval of all key policies such as operations, risk management, compliance, conflict of interests and formal business plans and strategies. In addition, the board has responsibility for the effective and adequate oversight of the operations, even those that are outsourced to ensure business is conducted in a prudent manner. We will now discuss certain elements of the board, starting with its composition. All directors need to be actively involved in the oversight of the licensee. The composition should address any dominance of risk emanating from a specific individual or individuals. In addition, key person risk should be periodically reviewed and managed appropriately. For example, CSP licensees should develop and implement formal succession and or contingency plans to address key person risk. Finally, the board responsibility should remain distinct from senior management, even if they are comprised of the same persons. Board meetings. The frequency and duration of meetings should be commensurate with the nature, scale, and complexity of the CSP business. Furthermore, the meeting agenda needs to be structured, covering key areas such as business strategy, operations, financial performance, compliance, and risk management, inclusive of cyber risk. The board packs need to be circulated prior to the meetings to allow directors adequate preparation time. It is important to keep in mind how crucial this is for a board comprised of independent directors. The drafted minutes of each meeting should be well structured. Minutes must contain adequate details about the key discussion points and challenges, as the minutes are evidence of the board and its committees fulfilling their oversight responsibilities. All agreed action points must be recorded, including deliverables, responsible parties and associated timelines. Board training and development, all directors should regularly update and refresh their skills and knowledge. This will help the entity ensure directors keep abreast of the business and regulatory environment, applicable best practices as well as emerging risks that could impact the business. Licensees should also maintain appropriate documentation of their training and education programs, for example, through training logs. All directors should be aware of their legal duties and regulatory responsibilities. Performance evaluation, the board should carry out periodic assessments of both the board as a whole and of individual board members as well as its governance practices. 
The board should take any corrective actions or make any improvements deemed necessary or appropriate to increase the effectiveness of its actions. These evaluations should be documented. The design, execution, and documentation of performance evaluations should be commensurate with the nature, scale, and complexity of the licensee. We will now discuss some main points relating to senior management and any established committees. Senior management is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the company, assuming delegated authority from the board. Under the direction of the board, senior management should ensure the institution's activities are consistent with the business strategy, risk appetite, and its board-approved policies. Senior management should have the necessary experience, competencies, and integrity to manage the businesses under their supervision. It should be noted that it is a statutory minimum criterion of licensing that a member of senior management, in their role as an officer or controller of the institution, should be a fit and proper person to fill that position. The management structure adopted by a CSP should be appropriate to the nature, scale, and complexity of the business. In the case of smaller institutions, the board and senior management may overlap but the responsibilities of the board and senior management are distinct and should be viewed separately. In addition, the organizational structure should ensure an appropriate segregation of duties is maintained in the allocation of roles and responsibilities. When possible, areas related to risk and compliance should be independent from client-facing business activities. A licensee may decide to establish board and or management committees for risk, compliance, and client onboarding. The first step is for the board to decide whether this is appropriate. The purpose, structure, duties, and meeting arrangements of the committee should be formalized, such as using a terms of reference. The board may delegate authority to board committee subject to full board oversight and ratification of key decisions that materially impact the institution's operations. Finally, the licensee is reminded that senior management and committees do not alleviate the board of its responsibilities. Let's now discuss the management of conflicts of interest. Directors have a duty to avoid, manage or minimize conflicts of interest and should, wherever possible, arrange their personal and business affairs to avoid direct and indirect conflicts of interest. The board should establish, implement, document and maintain an effective conflict of interest policy for both itself and the management and staff of the institution. The policy would outline the expected standards of behavior as well as the consequences for any noncompliance with its standards. When we refer to conflicts of interest, we do not only refer to actual but also potential circumstances that can raise concerns in this regard. Where a conflict of interest is identified with a client, this needs to be managed appropriately. A disclosure will need to be made to the client prior to proceeding with any transaction. Where conflicts of interest arise, the CSP must keep adequate records of such conflicts, for example logs and copies of communication, and act at all times to ensure it does not unfairly place its interests above those of its clients. All reasonable steps to manage conflicts to prevent damage to clients' interests must be taken. On the left side of the slide, we can observe fundamental risk management activities. On the right side are tools and steps to establish an appropriate risk management framework. Let's now discuss some key points. The board is responsible for risk oversight. This means that the board must ensure the company develops and implements an appropriate risk management framework. The framework should consist of activities related to ensuring effective risk identification, measurement, assessment, monitoring, control, and mitigation of risk on an ongoing basis. A key part of the framework is the risk appetite, which must be documented. The company must establish the level of aggregate risk it is willing to assume and manage in order to achieve its objectives. From that view, the risk appetite is connected to the strategic and risk objectives of the company. Once the risk appetite has been defined, the company should set up a process to identify notable risks across the organization and assess the risks. The company's policies and procedures should reflect the actions that the licensee intends to take to manage risks. Those risks should be managed in accordance with the risk appetite, with the implementation of suitable controls. Some examples of good practices to meet the regulatory expectations include Each licensee must maintain a risk register detailing key risks which are inherent to its business. For each risk, the assessment of impact and likelihood forms part of the inherent risk assessment. Appropriate controls must be mapped to the identified risks. The controls should be reviewed periodically to ensure they remain effective and work as intended. Licensees must perform any remedial actions to address any identified deficiencies. The primary risk management objective is to ensure key risks are effectively managed and the residual risks remain within the established risk appetite. Let's now move to some other considerations for managing risk. 
Concerning risk management tools, the company needs to demonstrate that the tools, like the risk register, are used effectively and that the relevant staff have the necessary skills and knowledge to execute the risk management framework. The board and committee should receive periodic risk reporting to facilitate effective oversight of risk and the internal control environment of the organization. The authority's corporate governance policy sets the annual board review of the risk management framework as a minimum requirement. Each licensee must have a strong risk culture, where staff are provided with suitable training that raises risk awareness and knowledge of prudent risk management practices. This should ensure staff can identify and respond to risk incidents in accordance with internal policies and regulatory expectations. The board shall always remain responsible for risk oversight, inclusive of the risk that emanates from outsourced arrangements. Business continuity and disaster recovery plans need to capture material risks and be tested at least annually. The board must be informed of the results, in addition to any recommended changes and or corrective actions. Additionally, the board should review these plans at least annually. We will now focus on the compliance program. A compliance program is not limited to activities related to money laundering slash terrorist finance risks. It must contain elements related to regulatory compliance, maintenance of policies and procedures, advisory, monitoring, training and reporting to the board. Any set of policies and procedures should have provisions for regular review and update to ensure they remain relevant. The compliance program should include monitoring activities with assurance reviews to assess the adherence of business operations against internal policies and regulatory requirements. This is an important feature of an effective second line of defense. Further to the above-mentioned requirements, it is necessary to establish an ethical framework and strong compliance culture to prevent any harmful behavior and unethical business practices. Furthermore, the role of compliance staff needs to be defined with adequate segregation of duties and authority within the organization to ensure the role can be executed effectively. In addition, staff should receive appropriate training that is aligned with their role, responsibilities, and regulatory requirements. Finally, the establishment of an appropriate reporting framework to the board and management are also an important component of an effective compliance program. In that way, the board and management will have adequate oversight of the conduct of business and the level of compliance with regulatory requirements. Next on the agenda is outsourcing. The starting point is the guidance notes, which provide information about the steps a CSP should follow if it decides to outsource any material activities. The guidance requires licensees to implement adequate policies and procedures to effectively manage and monitor outsourced arrangements. The outsourcing framework implemented by a licensee to oversee and manage the life cycle of outsourced activities must be commensurate with the size and complexity of the licensee, as well as, the materiality of outsourced arrangements. Licensees need to establish criteria for what constitutes material outsourcing. While this is important for governance and risk management purposes, a licensed CSP must also notify the authority prior to entering into a new outsourcing arrangement that is deemed material. A no objection must be received from the authority before proceeding to outsource the activity. Other key aspects of the outsourcing framework must include a risk evaluation process. This evaluation should identify the key risks posed by the outsourced activity and address how any risks arising from it are to be mitigated and or effectively managed. A licensee must also conduct appropriate due diligence when considering an outsourcing arrangement as part of its evaluation. The due diligence review should include but not be limited to assessing the quality of staff to deliver the service, whether the provider has adequate information and data security, adequate operational infrastructure and appropriate business continuity and disaster recovery plans. Also, licensees must execute a legally binding written agreement setting out the contractual terms and conditions governing relationships, obligations, responsibilities, rights, and expectations of the contracting parties in the outsourcing arrangement. The authority's guidance provides further details outlining what should be included in the agreement. Lastly but of significant importance is the ongoing monitoring of outsourced arrangements. Licensees must be able to demonstrate that these activities are adequately monitored and managed. This can include the use of management information and calls and meetings with the service provider. Our next topic in the compliance section is complaints handling. The main elements of an effective complaints handling process are the formulation of a policy and the establishment of adequate procedures and disclosure to clients. A CSP is required to have a transparent procedure and respond to customers in a professional and timely manner. Some steps that a CSP can take to fulfill this requirement include the disclosure of the process within client agreements and or the company's website. 
the communication channels should include a clear description of the means to submit a complaint. Licensees must acknowledge receipt of a complaint in a timely manner. The licensee must also establish clear standards including a reasonable time frame to resolve complaints and communication with the client. The primary objective should be to arrive at a fair outcome for the client. Records of complaints must be maintained to facilitate the effective management and oversight of these matters. We would now like to share some key takeaways from this section. Good governance practices are key. It is important for licensees to implement an effective governance framework to facilitate effective oversight of strategic initiatives and risks impacting the organization. There should also be adequate reporting in the governance structure to facilitate informed decision-making. Licensees must also implement effective risk management and compliance programs. These frameworks must be adequately embedded within each company to ensure key risks are identified and the appropriate mitigating actions are in place to manage risks effectively. Where possible, staff with primary responsibility for second line of defense activities, like risk and compliance, must be independent of the first line. Effective implementation of these programs should ensure consistent adherence to the minimum licensing criteria. Training is also key to building knowledge and awareness of risk and compliance matters. Appropriate training should also enhance the risk and compliance culture within the organization. Finally, each licensee must ensure it has transparent and fair procedures to guide the management of complaints. Complaints should be managed in a professional manner, with adequate communication with the client from the initial submission of a complaint to its resolution. The objective is to arrive at a fair and amicable solution. Now on to the anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financing portion of the CSP presentation. This section will focus on the sector's main money laundering slash terrorist financing, ML slash TF, risks and vulnerabilities and examine some money laundering slash terrorist financing trends and typologies as seen in the National Risk Assessment, NRA. We will also cover the results of our supervisory work within the sector and discuss the preventive measures otherwise known as the AML-ATF regulations which are designed to make your AML-ATF program robust and comprehensive. Finally, we will highlight how the published guidance notes can support each entity in achieving greater AML-ATF compliance. This slide represents several key pieces of AML-ATF and sanctions legislation that impact the CSP sector. You will note that the International Sanctions Act 2003 is a standalone piece of legislation, separate from the AML legislation. For this seminar, we will only focus on the 2008 Proceeds of Crime AML-ATF regulations, regulations or POCR, and the Supervision and Enforcement Act otherwise known as the SEA. The 2008 regulations apply to all regulated financial institutions, including CSPs. We emphasize the regulations here because it is the main piece of legislation that the authority uses to check a regulated financial institution's compliance when we conduct an AML on-site. It is expected that a CSP's AML-ATF program has policies and procedures in place to cover all of the regulations. Here are a few regulations we would like to highlight. Customer due diligence, CDD, whereby the terms are explained and processes are documented for the collection of CDD and verification of clients. Enhanced due diligence, this is where having identified politically exposed persons, PEPs, is important. The regulations also make a distinction between local, Bermuda, PEPs versus foreign international PEPs. There should also be consideration of any other high-risk factors. Simplified due diligence, if applicable, this would not be applicable if the CSP does not have low-risk clients. Ongoing monitoring, providing a review schedule fitting the assigned risk level. For example, 1, 3 and 5 years for high, medium and low-risk customers. The timing of verification is crucial to ensure that services are provided efficiently and with accuracy. It is important to verify information or documents at the appropriate time, ideally before services are provided. However, it is understood that this may not always be feasible and deviations from this practice should be the exception, not the norm, when conducting business. Requirement to cease transactions etc., giving consideration to file a suspicious activity report, SAR, with the Financial Intelligence Agency, FIA. Ensuring that CSP branches and subsidiaries are also implementing the minimum requirements. It is important to appropriately apply the obligation on reliance, if reliance is used. CSP should ensure that any reliance on third parties has been considered and that they appropriately uphold Bermuda's AML-ATF obligations. If outsourcing is used, 
those respective AML slash ATF roles should be clearly documented. There must be a Bermuda officer within the regulated entity who is responsible for overseeing the outsourced AML arrangements. Regulated entities are still responsible and can be held liable if something goes wrong concerning outsourcing, therefore, any outsourced functions must be appropriately monitored. A regulated entity using outsourcing should have procedures to satisfy itself that the third-party screening procedures are effective in ensuring employee competence and probity. The regulations also discuss the systems and controls that must be in place, including having a business risk assessment, BRA, that must be updated when the regulated financial institution or RFI circumstances change, for example, with the addition of a new product and service. It is also important for CSPs to have an individual in the position of money laundering reporting officer, MLRO, who is adequately trained to carry out that role with an appropriate reporting procedure in place. Finally, the RFI should ensure that their independent audit and training obligations are adhered to, as well as to have a compliance office employed at the managerial level who is adequately trained to carry out their role. The compliance officer is responsible for ensuring that each regulated entity has a fully compliant AML-ATF program. The CSP sector has matured significantly since the implementation of the Corporate Service Providers Act and its full regulation in 2018. There are two classes of CSP licenses, unlimited and limited licenses. Currently, there are 95 limited CSP licensees, with no unlimited licenses issued. There are approximately 12,000 customers. In terms of risk, this heat map is taken from Bermuda's 2020 National Risk Assessment, NRA, and shows that the inherent risk for money laundering within the CSP sector is based on the overall money laundering threats and inherent vulnerabilities. This is higher than 2017 inherent risk rating based on an enhanced understanding of the sector since the last NRA. The increase in the inherent risk rating for money laundering was due to the FIA receiving requests from overseas counterparts, this means that other intelligence units had information related to money laundering threats within Bermuda. There was also an increase in SARS, or suspicious activity reports, due to the increased AML-ATF oversight that is now in place. SARS and confiscated assets data can provide useful information in determining the money laundering and terrorist financing risk within Bermuda. On terrorist financing risk, it was established that Bermuda's terrorist financing risk was low in the previous two NRAs. While there is no evidence for Bermuda being a source of terrorist financing, the jurisdiction has made a number of recommendations to strengthen its anti-terrorist financing framework to ensure that the regime remains robust and is able to adapt appropriately to any emerging threats. Bermuda's CSP client sector profiles are perceived as high vulnerability given CSP service a broad range of legal person entities. These companies often have complex corporate structures, with beneficial owners who may be high net worth individuals, HNWIs, based in higher risk jurisdictions and or in higher risk industries. Bermuda will be undertaking another NRA this year, which will reflect any changes of risk since the last one. Here, we have highlighted some examples of the red flag indicators for money laundering. Transactions or services that utilize complex and opaque legal entities and arrangements, these would be defined as transactions that do not make any economic sense for the customer. They may also have complex legal structures which make them less transparent and not easy to understand. The following points are also red flags that could indicate suspicious activity. Foreign private foundations that operate in countries with secrecy laws, making it difficult to obtain the necessary customer due diligence, CDD. The use of nominee agreements to hide beneficial ownership, again making it difficult to obtain the correct CDD for the true asset contributor. Intercompany loan transactions and or multi-jurisdictional wire transfers with complex financial transactions where it is difficult to follow the origin and intended destination of monies. Money is received from or sent to countries that the customer does not have any plausible connections with. The operation of virtual offices providing CSP services is another area to watch closely. Although there are legitimate uses for virtual offices, especially for smaller companies that wish to provide an agile and flexible way of working without the commitment of a permanent premise, unfortunately these can be misused for money laundering. Not having a locally based company secretary can also create difficulties in conducting due diligence and verification processes. The formation by CSPs of shell companies is another concern. Typically, money launderers use shell companies to transfer illegitimate funds through a legal entity, providing the appearance of a legitimate structure when the real purpose is to launder money, and finally. Unethical CSPs with full discretionary authority over the customer's accounts is another red flag. This could entice a CSP or its employees to conduct unauthorized or illegal transactions. 
It is important to note this list is not exhaustive and new red flags are being identified as we continue collecting data on money laundering and terrorist financing cases. Understanding the money laundering threats and vulnerabilities should assist in the preparation of a CSP's Business Risk Assessments, or BRA. Stage 1 is identifying and assessing a company's inherent risks. There are four main categories of risk that each CSP should identify at a minimum. There are customer risks, geographic or country risks, and product or service risks in addition to delivery channel risks. When we look at the four different categories of risk factors for the CSP sector, the main threats and vulnerabilities lie within customer risk and product and service risk. Typical customers within the CSP sector are exposed to money laundering from foreign sources, specifically related to tax evasion, fraud, corruption, market manipulation, insider trading and so forth. Therefore, the money laundering threat to this sector is high. It can also be a challenge to obtain CDD and information on the beneficial ownership due to the sector's international client base. Opaque customer structures pose a major risk to transparency. When we examine the product and service offerings for the sector, it has been identified as a major gateway for international interests in Bermuda's financial services market. As a result, the sector is potentially exposed to a higher scale of money laundering when compared to other sectors. A 2013 FATF report of suspicious transactions revealed a number of legal professionals were complicit or unknowingly involved in their clients' criminality. It can be challenging for CSPs to manage large or complex structures as they must fully understand their clients' business objectives and activities. The threat and vulnerability levels in the geographic risk or country risk and delivery channel risk sectors are comparable to those in the other sectors. Stage 2 is assessing the likelihood of a risk occurring and its impact. Once all the relevant risks have been identified, it is important to assess the likelihood and impact of the money laundering risks that the business could be exposed to based on the risk factors identified. This will vary based on a company's business plan and its target market. Some CSPs focus on high net worth individuals that often come with high risk factors such as the nature of their business as it pertains to how they make money versus customers that are regulated entities. Stage 3 involves applying the appropriate controls to mitigate risk. The next step would be to implement the proper AML-ATF controls, such as a documented policy and procedure manual. Having the appropriate systems in place includes technology for housing data or screening processes. In addition to ensuring the compliance and reporting officer are fit and proper. Stage 4 is reviewing the residual risk and reviewing the BRA annually, or when changes occur. This will be discussed further in another session. For this session, the aim is to provide a high-level overview of the BRA process. Typologies or techniques of money laundering typically found within the CSP sector include multi-jurisdictional structures, bank secrecy laws, poor bank regulation, limited corporate registration requirements and other areas of deficiency in certain jurisdictions, not meeting the FATF standards for preventing money laundering. The use of specialized financial intermediary slash professionals unknowingly or knowingly, in this instance it would be those with knowledge to assist with money laundering as there can be some sort of kickback or incentive for the professional. The use of nominee shareholders and directors. Shell companies can be used for legitimate purposes to hold stock or intangible assets, however, their susceptibility for misuse is considerable. In the FATF 2010 report, Money laundering using trust and corporate service providers case studies highlighted how a corporate service provider can be misused by way of a shell company or operation. All of these typologies and techniques highlight the main goals and priorities of a money launderer. Their aim is to provide anonymity or conceal the ultimate beneficial owner, the main asset contributor or controller of the funds. And now we will turn it over to the Financial Intelligence Agency. The Financial Intelligence Agency will now discuss suspicious activity reporting statistics, trends, a typology, and some reminders about SAR reporting. The next section of this presentation will cover suspicious activity report statistics, trends, and typologies in the sector seen by the Financial Intelligence Agency. This slide provides an overview of suspicious activity report filings in 2023 by corporate service providers. The year 2023 saw a total of four suspicious activity reports filed by three corporate service providers with the Financial Intelligence Agency, FIA. Additionally, no corporate service providers registered with the FIA in 2023. 
Please note that it is important for reporting entities that have several reporting sector licenses to file under the reporting sector license and corresponding reporting entity where the suspect activity was detected. This oversight has permitted lower filings in this reporting sector. CSP Trends Since January 1, 2020, the FIA has received a total of 32 filings from 17 CSPs. Seven trends that have been identified in these filings are sanctions, suspected fraud, suspected tax offenses, suspected corruption, shared subject, entity activity noted in a CSP filing and a request for information from an overseas FIU, refusal by clients to comply with CDD requirements and declined slash refused business due to suspect activity. In the case of overseas FIU requests for information, there are instances when a CSP and an overseas FIU have filed information with the FIA about the same person, company, suspect activity, and or suspect transaction. Let's now review a CSP typology involving suspected money laundering and tax offenses as well as sanctions. In this case, the client requested that CDD information be sent by the CSP to a sanctioned bank in Eastern Europe. A suspicious activity report was filed by a local CSP about a client, company, who was requesting that due diligence information be forwarded to its bank with respect to the corporate director of the CSP and the titular nominee shareholder of the CSP. There was no concern in sending this information, however, the CSP was being asked to provide this information to a bank located in Eastern Europe. This Eastern European bank is subject to international sanctions arising from Russian hostile action toward Ukraine. Likewise, an additional party commenced emailing the CSP to inquire about the status of the client's request. This additional party has the same name as a Russian associate of a top Russian official who is subject to international sanctions. The CSP was concerned that requesting due diligence from the additional party, who is not a beneficial owner or director of the client, might tip off the additional party that the CSP's suspicions of money laundering and or sanctions had been raised. Similarly, explaining to the client that the CSP could not engage with a sanctioned bank was likely to tip the client off to the concerns of the CSP. The CSP decided not to respond to the additional party's emails and file with the FIA. Red flags of suspicious activity that were noted in this filing are 1. The client was requesting that due diligence information be forwarded to its sanctioned bank in Eastern Europe. 2. An additional party, who could not be identified and was deemed unrelated to the client, was inquiring about the status of the due diligence information being forwarded. 3. The additional party used emails to follow up on the client's request. 4. This additional party had the same name as a Russian associate of a top Russian official, who is subject to international sanctions. 5. The client seemed unaware or unfazed that the receiving bank was sanctioned internationally due to Russian hostile action toward Ukraine. 6. The client and the additional party assumed that the CSP would not adhere to international sanction guidance, and 7. If the additional party was actually the Russian associate of a top Russian official, there is a possibility that bribery, fraud and or coercion were involved. Report Indicators Report indicators selected by the CSP to identify the characteristics within the narrative of the essay are included, adverse media, arms slash military, high-risk country, high-risk recipient, legal arrangements, foreigners, money laundering, money transfer, nominee director slash shareholders, PEP foreign, politician, sanctions list, and watch lists. Key takeaway. Thanks to the due diligence checks conducted by the CSP, incidents of adverse media linked to the suspected additional party and the East European Bank were quickly detected. The identification of these key red flags of suspect activity helped the CSP to make the informed decision to deny the client's request and closely monitor subsequent activity. Quality of Suspicious Activity Report Filings in 2023 The overall quality was good and none of the reports were rejected by the Financial Intelligence Agency. As a reminder, always provide any supporting documentation e.g., copies of IDs, account opening documents, and adverse media links that will support the narrative of the suspicious activity report. This information assists with the analysis of the FIA analysts and the dissemination of informative disclosures to the competent authorities in Bermuda and in other jurisdictions. Upcoming actions for the FIA The FIA will be providing guidance to corporate service providers about the Bermuda consent regime as it pertains to the termination of clients due to suspect activity. This action is being taken as FIA consent requests have been filed by corporate service providers seeking advice on how to terminate a client relationship involving suspect activity, especially when the client may potentially seek to obtain the services of another local corporate service provider. 
SAR filing reminders. The FIA encourages the filing of suspicious activity reports involving declined business of a current or potential customer due to the identification of suspect activity, for example, a change in communication methods, a show of aggressiveness, the use of suspect comments, the detection of suspect transactions or the detection of adverse media. Please note that the FIA discourages filings based solely on a client's or potential client's refusal to provide CDD when no suspect activity can be identified. In this section, we turn it back over to the AML supervision team. The AML supervision team will now discuss trends in noncompliance, AML slash ATF monitoring and controls and the authority's AML on-site and off-site examination process. We've been through the obligations briefly, and they are located in the POCR, the primary legislation we use when evaluating a company during an on-site. When it comes to supervision, the AML slash ATF department has determined that CSPs have faced compliance challenges related to a number of regulatory obligations. Please take note of the following points listed on this slide. We would encourage you to review your policies and procedures against the POCR, particularly in relation to the obligations listed. Sanctions, lack of training and lack of awareness are other challenges that we have identified. The BMA is responsible for reviewing regulated entities' compliance with Bermuda's sanctions regime. It is our responsibility to check that your sanctions policies and procedures are appropriate and are effectively applied. During our on-sites, we have identified a need for further training in this area. AML-ATF audits raise other concerns including gaps which are not properly captured. For example, audit reports should provide a detailed overview of any gaps or areas of improvement which could be applied to the AML-ATF framework. This helps a company mitigate its money laundering risks. Finally, when regulated entities use shelf policies that are written by third-party consultants and rely on these firms without a solid understanding of the regulations and AML obligations, they are at risk for noncompliance. Having a third-party consultant does not automatically equate to noncompliance, however, we have found that when entities use this option sometimes AML policies have not been implemented properly in practice. This can lead to challenges during on-sites and sometimes uncover systemic issues. To prevent money laundering and terrorist financing, CSPs should assess and document the robustness of their AML-ATF framework. It is important to review is your AML-ATF policies and procedures to ensure they are up to date with the legislation. This also should include sanctions policies that are compliant with the sanctions legislation and guidance. CSP should also ensure compliance and reporting officers, management, and staff, as well as board members, are receiving the appropriate AML-ATF training for the respective roles. Of course, every AML-ATF process should be documented, which assists with record-keeping and tracking for reporting purposes. There should be a control in place for every procedure. CSP should ask if their policies and procedures are being appropriately implemented by performing quality assurance checks on their controls. Finally, companies should ensure they have a well-scoped, comprehensive, and independent AML-ATF audit performed annually by a qualified person. Once completed, it is essential to review the results, take action on the outstanding issues and address any additional items. This will improve the firm's overall compliance with the AML-ATF obligations and prepare the company for an AML-ATF on-site examination. Please refer to the BMA guidance notes for further clarification on qualifications and independence. As part of the ML-TF preventative measures and controls, the BMA conducts on-site examinations, whereby we review the AML framework in place to ensure it meets the legislative requirements. This is done as a prevention mechanism to ensure that the companies operating within Bermuda are not misused for money laundering or terrorist financing. Companies should be prepared. This is a company's opportunity to showcase its robust compliance framework. It should be business as usual, as we are only checking against what companies have already committed to as part of their licensing requirements. The documented AML-ATF policies and processes should be reviewed at least annually to ensure compliance with the regulations. This also includes companies demonstrating that the appropriate training has taken place. Interviews with senior management and select staff are also conducted as part of the on-site. File testing submissions should be submitted in a timely manner and there should be no modifications to documents once the on-site has started except for client requests or business-as-usual changes to client information. Closing meetings are held to discuss the CSP status. 
if there are significant findings or gaps, consideration will be given to enforcement. Now on to the enforcement part of this presentation. Turning to enforcement, this section provides a summary of the 2018 Enforcement Guide Statement of Principles and Guidance on the Exercise of Enforcement Powers Regulated Institutions, which we will refer to as the 2018 Enforcement Guide. This presentation will focus on four main areas. 1. The principles of enforcement. 2. Referral to enforcement. 3. Enforcement considerations and options, and. Enforcement is the use of formal powers of the authority to compel compliance or to penalize noncompliance with the statutory or regulatory requirements for all licensed entities. Enforcement action that is proportionate, effective, and dissuasive enhances Bermuda's international reputation, thereby contributing to making Bermuda a desirable location in which to conduct business. The authority will exercise its enforcement powers in service to its principal objectives and duties. To supervise, regulate, and inspect any financial institution which operates in or from within Bermuda. To promote the financial stability and soundness of financial institutions. To assist with the detection and prevention of financial crime to assist foreign regulatory authorities in the discharge of their duties, and to supervise and monitor compliance with all AML ATF requirements. The authority will exercise its formal enforcement powers in accordance with these principles. However, the overarching consideration is the protection of all customers of regulated institutions and the protection of Bermuda as a well-regulated international jurisdiction. The authority expects all CSPs to comply with all regulatory obligations, including the minimum criteria for licensing. Noncompliance creates risks for customers and may threaten the long-term sustainability of the CSP. Furthermore, the cost of compliance will usually be less than the costs of noncompliance. Typical post-enforcement action costs for a CSP may include increased headcount, consultancy fees, increased technological budget, reputational damage, potential loss of customers and partners, possible attention from other regulators and long periods of regulatory oversight as well as civil penalties. The moral of the story here is, it's cheaper to be compliant. The authority is committed to engaging with regulated institutions in a cooperative and transparent manner. As such, the authority will not apply its enforcement powers to address every issue of non-compliance with a regulatory obligation. This is an outline of the process that is most commonly followed. On the left-hand side of this slide is remediation under the supervisory umbrella. Most issues that arise will be addressed as part of the normal supervisory relationship between the authority and the CSP. The proactive supervision and monitoring of CSPs and the open, cooperative relationship that exists between them and the authority will often result in a positive outcome without the need to invoke the more formal use of enforcement powers. In those cases, the authority will expect the CSP to act promptly in taking the necessary remedial action to regain compliance. In the event that the regulated institution fails to adequately do this, the supervisor will refer the matter to enforcement. Where a CSP has failed to comply with a major statutory requirement and has failed to remediate adequately, it may be appropriate to respond with formal enforcement action. In such a case, the issue is escalated to the enforcement department as depicted on the sliding scale. On occasion, there will be agreement between the supervision and the enforcement departments as to the best course of action. In some instances, there is a need for further investigation of the breach, as seen in the third stage of the slide. The authority may appoint an investigator, pursuant to Section 50 of the Corporate Service Provider Business Act 2012. During the course of any investigation, the authority or an appointed investigator may issue written notices requiring information. The investigation may also require a formal interview of persons associated with the CSP. Noncompliance with an investigation is a criminal offense, which carries a penalty, on conviction, of a fine of $10,000 or six months imprisonment or both a fine and imprisonment. The final three stages of this sliding scale include the authority's decision-making process. During the decision-making process, the Enforcement Committee of the Authority meets to discuss each enforcement action on at least two occasions. After the first meeting, the authority will either issue a warning notice, seek further information from the enforcement department or decide to take no action. If a warning notice has been issued, the CSP will have the opportunity to make a representation with respect to the particular set out in the warning notice within a specified period. On the expiration of that period the enforcement committee will meet to discuss the enforcement action again, 
taking into consideration any representations that have been received. The authority will then either issue a decision notice to vary or confirm the position taken in the warning notice or decide to take no further action. Issuing a decision notice is the second stage of the decision-making process. The final stage of the decision-making process occurs if the CSP appeals the decision notice issued against it. When a CSP has appealed a decision notice, in most cases the enforcement action is not imposed until the appeal has been adjudicated. Additionally, there will be no publication of the enforcement action until the appeal has been adjudicated. If the issue is potentially serious, the supervisor will refer it to the enforcement department for consideration of a formal enforcement action. A matter will be potentially serious if it creates a risk of harm to customers or to the reputation of Bermuda as a well-regulated financial center. Matters which are typically considered to require enforcement action include breaches of the minimum criteria for registration slash licensing, breaches of minimum solvency slash liquidity requirements, issues touching upon a person's fitness and propriety, Significant failures in corporate governance that pose a risk to the effective operation of the business and or a risk to customers. Failures to comply with AML-ATF obligations. Failure to implement an agreed remediation plan adequately. Possible fraud, misrepresentation, or other financial crime. Repeated failures to submit statutory financial information statements. Conducting unauthorized business. Noncompliance with international sanctions obligations. Insolvency or where circumstances may require the winding up of the entity on just and equitable grounds, and circumstances where a formal investigation or the appointment of a reporting inspector may be necessary. An imposition of enforcement action does not operate to suspend ongoing supervision and remediation. Enforcement action and supervision slash remediation serve different purposes and operate independently of each other. Supervision examines the current and future conduct of the CSP with the expectation that all noncompliance will be remediated within a reasonable time period, irrespective of any formal enforcement action that may be taken. However, enforcement action is designed to address specific failures and mark them with effective and dissuasive action. Effective remediation by a CSP does not preclude the authority from taking enforcement action with respect to the original failures. Matters which are typically considered to require formal enforcement action include Breaches of the minimum criteria for registration or licensing. Issues touching upon a person's fitness and propriety. Significant failures in corporate governance that pose a risk to the effective operation of the business and or a risk to customers. Failures to comply with AML-ATF obligations. Failure to implement an agreed remediation plan adequately. Possible fraud, misrepresentation, or other financial crime. Repeated failures to submit statutory returns. Conducting unauthorized business. Noncompliance with international sanctions obligations. Insolvency or where circumstances may require the winding up of the entity on just and equitable grounds, and circumstances where a formal investigation or the appointment of a reporting inspector may be necessary. An imposition of enforcement action does not operate to suspend ongoing supervision and remediation. Enforcement action and supervision or remediation serve different purposes and operate independently of each other. Supervision examines the current and future conduct of the CSP with the expectation that all noncompliance will be remediated within a reasonable time period, irrespective of any formal enforcement action that may be taken. However, enforcement action is designed to address specific failures and mark them with effective and dissuasive action. Effective remediation by a CSP does not preclude the authority from taking enforcement action with respect to the original failures. The authority has a wide range of enforcement options available to deal with failure to comply with both prudential and AML-ATF requirements, which it employs in an effective, proportionate, and dissuasive manner. On assessment of the enforcement action the authority may impose the following enforcement options. 1. Imposition of directions, restrictions, and conditions. 2. Imposition of a civil penalty. 3. Public censure. 4. Prohibition orders against individual directors and officers. 5. Objections to controllers. 6. Revocation of license. 7. Winding up. 8. Referral to police. All of these types of enforcement options are decided by the Enforcement Committee and Enforcement Options 1 to 6 require the issuance of a warning notice and decision notice. The authority will consider all the relevant facts and circumstances prior to taking an enforcement action. An assessment will be made on a case-by-case -case basis but will also take into account the wider context. 
The relevant facts and circumstances for an enforcement action are as follows. The nature, seriousness, and impact of the breach. The conduct of the institution following the breach. The compliance history of the institution. Action taken by the authority in similar cases. Guidance previously provided by the authority. The prevention and deterrence associated with enforcing against the CSP breach. Action taken by other regulatory or law enforcement authorities. In many instances the most appropriate form of enforcement action is that of a civil penalty. Annex A of the Enforcement Guide provides a detailed table of the characteristics of each breach that the authority assesses when arriving at the appropriate level of a civil penalty. During the assessment, each characteristic is evaluated to determine its appropriate range. Then, a determination is made of the appropriate range of the civil penalty in light of the assessment of each characteristic. Breaches of the Corporate Service Provider Business Act 2012, CSPB Act, attract a maximum civil penalty of $500,000 for each breach. Additionally, breaches of the Proceeds of Crime, Anti-Money Laundering and Anti-Terrorist Financing, Regulations 2008, AML ATF Regulations, attract a maximum civil penalty of $10 million. CSP should note that the authority may issue a single civil penalty that reflects all the conduct rather than impose separate penalties for each breach, however, this is a discretion exercised by the authority. It is often the case that a CSP with prudential breaches of the CSPB Act also has breaches of the AML ATF regulations. As such, a non-compliant CSP may find itself on the receiving end of substantial civil penalties if its conduct is particularly egregious. The table is a guide and the level of civil penalty recommended in individual cases may differ. Each case will be assessed on its own merits taking into account the relevant facts and information. The most important factors will be the reputational risk to Bermuda and any loss or risk of loss to clients. The authority has identified issues that have been noted in a number of CSPs in recent years and has listed a few to assist CSPs in avoiding those common pitfalls. There has been an increase of instances in which CSPs have failed to comply with the filing of annual returns as prescribed by Section 55 of the CSPB Act. CSPs are reminded of the important role that annual returns play in the authority's ability to assess the viability of their businesses. The absence of appropriately filed annual returns may lead the authority to conclude that the CSP business is not being conducted in a prudent manner. When considering material change notifications, CSPs are reminded of the obligations outlined in Sections 22 through 26 of the CSPB Act. Section 22 of the CSPB Act provides that no person shall become a shareholder controller or a majority shareholder controller of a licensed undertaking, which is a company, unless he has served written notice to the authority that he intends to become such a controller. The authority then considers whether to provide written notice that there is no objection to his becoming such a controller, or three months have elapsed without the authority serving written notice of objection. CSPs and their controllers are reminded that there is equality among directors and each director has joint and severable responsibility with regard to any and all regulatory obligations. The authority's position is that each director is responsible for the breaches that the CSP incurs. The failure of a director to ensure adequate oversight of a CSP could leave the authority to question its fitness and propriety. The position of director is vitally important to any prudently operated business. Therefore, it should not be entered into lightly as there are serious consequences for directors who do not ensure that a firm operates in a prudent manner. Consequences may include prohibition orders or civil penalties against the individual directors. Finally, Bermuda is scheduled to be assessed in relation to its national AML ATF regime in 2027. The assessment conducted by the Caribbean Financial Action Task Force will review the effectiveness of Bermuda's AML ATF regime and will have a large impact on Bermuda's reputation as a well-regulated financial sector. Bermuda produced an NRA of its AML ATF threats and vulnerabilities in 2020 that identified CSPs as having a high threat rating for money laundering. Given the value of businesses administered by CSPs and that they are a major gateway for international interests into Bermuda's international financial services market, the sector is potentially exposed to a higher scale of money laundering than other sectors. A key component of reducing the risk of money laundering and terrorist financing posed to a CSP is robust risk-based AML ATF processes and procedures. The processes and procedures are outlined in the Proceeds of Crime, Anti-Money Laundering and Anti-Terrorist Financing, Regulations 2008 with guidance also available on the authority's website. As a policy, AML ATF breaches are always deemed potentially serious by the authority. 
a CSP that is in breach of its AML ATF obligations will likely face an enforcement action. As alluded to earlier, breaches of the AML ATF regulations attract a maximum penalty of $10 million for each breach. CSPs would be well-minded to ensure that they have instituted robust, risk-appropriate AML ATF processes and procedures. In summary, we discussed prudential and AML obligations and on-site trends before exploring enforcement powers and processes. You have participated today on behalf of your individual companies, and it is our hope that the information you take away will strengthen your company's systems and controls and improve your prudential and AML ATF compliance going forward. From a regulator's standpoint, we are here to support you in achieving these goals. From a country's standpoint, each of us has a role to play in contributing to a resilient and robust AML ATF and prudential framework in Bermuda to keep the bad actors out. We all have an important part to play and we welcome you to join us on this journey for your company and for the benefit of Bermuda. We are all in this together. If you have any questions for the authority following this session, please do not hesitate to contact us direct on aml at bma.bm for aml questions, csp at bma.bm for prudential inquiries, enforcement at bma.bm for enforcement queries and info at fia.bm for any FIA-related questions.